Let's talk about the signs of thermal failure. And specifically, we're going to talk about the signs of thermal failure as opposed to what it looks like when uh, a base oil and additive package oxidizes. Because sometimes the, um, the indicators are exactly the same, and sometimes they are different. So let's compare thermal failure versus oxidation. So thermal failure obviously happens at very, very high temperatures. We're talking sort of 200 degrees plus for base oils, and then you know maybe starting from about 90 degrees or up for, for some additives. But the catch is that thermal failure occurs more or less without the presence of oxygen, whereas oxidation begins at very, very low temperatures and then sort of accelerates by the Arrhenius rate rule. And we kind of need in most cases, oxygen to promote oxidation. So uh, where would you see a thermal failure? So a thermal failure would typically happen in something like a closed system where you have like a closed set of hydraulics or a closed thermal oil system. There's not really that ingress of oxygen into the system and so it's operating at very high temperatures and you get thermal breakdown. Oxidation, on the other hand, um, happens in an oxygen-rich environment, which is most environments, right? Because in your reservoir, you'll have a headspace with air in it. Air has oxygen. And really, um, you know, stopping oxidation is more about slowing down uh, this, uh, you know, uh, oxidation cycle, right? So this is a, a cycle that is continuing to happen. And really, we can't stop it. We can just slow down the growth of free radicals. All right. So let's say, for example, if I had two samples, one had experienced oxidation and one had experienced thermal failure then what kind of differences could I expect to see? Well, it goes down to the, the physical characteristics of the breakdown. So if you look at what would happen to the viscosity under oxidation and thermal failure conditions, well, we know that generally when uh, lubricants oxidize, they thicken, right? We expect the viscosity to, to increase. And this is because um, free radicals within uh, the lubricant uh, promote a, a process called polymerization and that can happen one of two ways, either addition or condensation. Now, thermal failure, when it breaks apart molecules, is also creating radicals too. And so it can also precipitate this, this um, addition reaction as well. So what you get is basically radicals wanting to connect to, to other molecules and creating longer chain molecules. And of course, molecules that have longer chains um, generally have higher viscosities. Now, on top of that, um, long chain polymers contribute as well to sludge and varnish. So we could expect that the sludge and the varnish in both cases will increase. Now, the nature of the sludge or varnish changes a little bit. So in thermal failure, you generally expect to see that sort of like hot baked on varnish, right? That's very, very difficult to remove unless you kind of get in there and physically scrub it off. Whereas oxidation tends to pr promote um, kind of more uh, soft varnish contaminants, right? Um, but it's on a case-by-case -case basis. Now, one thing that uh, is kind of different about thermal failure as opposed to oxidation is that thermal failure also takes long chain molecules and splits them, right? There's a process called thermal cracking where you're basically giving the, the, uh, the molecule so much energy that it breaks apart. Well, in that case, I've taken a long chain molecule and I've split it. So now I'm going from a higher viscosity to a lower viscosity. So depending on the situation, in thermal failure, sometimes my viscosity increases, but sometimes it also decreases. And with sludge and varnish, the other kind of nuance around thermal degradation is that I can also get the increase in, in coke um, as well as in suspension. So coke is like a, a black carbon, uh, very, very typical in jet engines. As an example, they, they form a lot of coke. And you also form like these grease-like uh, suspensions, right? And so they are basically um, products of thermal failure. One of the other things that's a little bit unique about thermal failure is alterations to the flashpoint. All right, so um, flashpoint is, uh, you know, I've talked about this in, in other videos. Flashpoint is, let's say, a proxy for the light ends that are present in the distribution of your bulk oil. So let's say, for example, I had a, a distribution of sizes, right? I had light ends on the left. Um, most, the bulk of the molecules is sort of centered around uh, the middle, and that's what really dictates your viscosity. And then you've got a bunch of heavier molecules to the right. So uh, Flashpoint is really talking about these light ends that can volatilize off into the headspace, right? Um, and so when they volatilize off, 
if there's a spark, then you're kind of mixing that with oxygen and it could potentially uh, combust. Now, let's think about what is happening to those molecules under thermal failure. In some instances, you are producing even more light ends, right? Because you're taking long chain molecules and you're cracking them. You're, you're giving them so much energy that they break in half and you're making even more volatile compounds, right? So in that case, now my headspace is full of even more volatile compounds, which is potentially going to lower the flash point, right? Because it means that my, my oil will flash at a lower temperature. Now, the reason there's a bit of nuance around this is because not all flash points are made equal, right? So if you think about how the flash point uh, test works, it's effectively, you know, you're taking a sample, you're heating it up to higher temperatures, you're exposing it to a spark, and at some point, you know, you've heated it up to a high enough temperature that it actually does, it sort of combusts, right? So that flash point is going to decrease, but only sometimes because it requires the production of more light ends, right? It requires that thermal cracking. All right, now let's think about what accelerates oxidation versus thermal failure. Now, there's plenty of things which are what we would call pro-oxidants, right? So, an example, exposure to radiation increases um, oxidation. Water contamination, right, is, is a big one. Um, exposure to metals, because they act as catalysts, right? That, that catalyzes the, the oxidation reaction. And we know from the Arrhenius rate rule that temperature increases double the rate um, for every roughly 10 degrees Celsius increase. On the other hand, most of those are not applicable to thermal failure. So if I add more metals uh, into uh, the reaction, it, it doesn't lower the energy at which thermal cracking occurs. It doesn't lower the energy at which thermal failure occurs. You know, adding water doesn't promote thermal failure either. If anything, water detracts from thermal failure because water has a very high specific heat and it tends to absorb a lot more a lot more heat, right? So um, you might be putting energy into the system and a lot of it is being absorbed by the water rather than the oil. So the way that you promote thermal failure is basically only by increasing the temperature. It's, it's, there's really no, there's not many other effects that can um, promote thermal failure. So there's some of the, the nuances that will help you distinguish an oxidative failure from a thermal failure.